Hello and welcome to the Mile End Institute for the fourth event in our series on the future of British democracy. My name is Robert Saunders, I'm the co-director of the Institute and it's a great pleasure to be able to welcome so many people to join us here today. So far in this series we've explored reform of the civil service, the role of the judiciary and judicial review and the place of corruption in the British state. But today we'll be focusing on the House of Lords, what it does, where it fits in our democracy and the case for reform. The House of Lords is the oldest part of the British Parliament and it has been reformed many times before. In fact, every governing party in the 20th century reformed either its powers or its composition or a combination of the two. Lords reform has been described as the Bermuda Triangle of British politics. Many governments have sailed in, not many have achieved their intended destination. Today, it remains an important part of our governing system with the power to scrutinize and amend legislation and even to delay it for up to a year. And in recent times, it's been especially prominent in debates around welfare reform, detention without trial, and most recently, the Internal Markets Bill, and in particular, the sections that could breach international law. So there's a great deal for us to discuss today, and we have three expert panelists to help us do that. I'm going to introduce each speaker in turn, and they've been asked to make some introductory remarks, after which I'll follow up with some subsidiary questions. Once all three of our panelists have spoken, we'll then open up a more general discussion, and I'll put some of your questions to the speakers. So please do type your questions in the chat box, and you can also post questions on Twitter using the hashtag MEI House of Lords. So our first speaker is Professor Philip Norton, or Lord Norton of Louth. Since 1998, he has combined an academic career as Professor of Government and Director of the Centre for Legislative Studies at the University of Hull, with a seat in the House of Lords, where he chaired the Constitution Committee from 2001 to 2004. He is a convener of the Campaign for an Effective Second Chamber and is the author of numerous books on the British Constitution. His most recent came out earlier this year, quick plug, Governing Britain, Parliament, Ministers and our Ambiguous Constitution. So thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to your remarks. Right, thank you very much and thank you much for the promotion to the book. Um, I've been invited to talk about the work of the House, but I thought it might be helpful just to put it in context um, initially, because I think the debate about the House of Lords tends to have a narrow and consequently misleading focus because discussion of the reform of the House of Lords is largely confined to the composition of the House and not the role that the House fulfills within the political system. Governments, when, act, when seeking to reform the Lords, have accepted that the tasks carried out by the House are appropriate and well fulfilled. The 2011 White Paper acknowledged the functions and stated the government believes that these functions should remain unchanged when the House of Lords is reformed and that it should continue this valuable work. So demands for reform thus focus on input legitimacy, how members are chosen, not on output legitimacy, that is what it, in other words, what it does. And I would suggest the focus on input legitimacy is flawed for two reasons. First, it takes as self-evident that the existing house is undemocratic. That isn't self-evident, as my colleague Colin Tyler, who specialises in democratic theory, has pointed out. Having an elected second chamber, well, as he put it, reduce the democratic character of the whole, that is, parliament. Secondly, it divorces form from function. The reason the House is able to fulfil its valuable work, to quote the White Paper, is because of who is in it. Composition is crucial. And that composition is key to determining the functions as well as the, how they're fulfilled. And the functions are shaped by the relationship of the House to the elected chamber. The Lords accepts the primacy of the Commons. Consequently, it sees its role as complementary to the elected House not competing with it, nor duplicating what it does. So let me then briefly outline the work that the House does and 
relate that to composition politically and individually. As a second chamber, it is a reflective chamber and as such it fulfills several functions. First and foremost, it's a chamber of legislative scrutiny. It accepts that the Commons determines the ends of legislation, but it may not have the time or political will to engage in consistent scrutiny of the detail. That is what the House of Lords does best, devoting most of its time to examining in detail government bills. Unlike in the Commons, all amendments are considered. The House does not utilise programme motions and amendments can be taken at third reading. Any peer can take part in detailed consideration at committee stage. So each year, anything between several hundred and several thousand amendments to government bills may be secured in the House of Lords. In the 2016-17 session, for example, it was just over 2,000. Scrutiny of bills is complemented by detailed scrutiny of secondary legislation. We often overlook the significance of delegated legislation in our legislative arrangements. And in the Lords, that scrutiny is achieved through the Delegated Powers and Regulatory Reform Committee, looking at the input side of legislation, and the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee, looking at the output side. Together, they undertake work for which there is no equivalent in the House of Commons. It's also a chamber of scrutiny of administration and public policy. Like the House of Commons, it's become more specialised, operating through committees, both permanent, such as the Constitution Committee and the Science and Technology Committee, and ad hoc, what are now known as special inquiry committees, designed to complement the work of the Commons. Using ad hoc committees allows the House to be fairly agile in addressing contemporary and important topics. It also serves, the House also serves an important expressive function, raising issues that may fall outside the usual party conflict and which may be unpopular, but merit debate. The House also serves to engage in a discourse with civil society. This was a point well made by the late Lord Sachs in his evidence to the Joint Committee on the Draft House of Lord Reform Bill. There is no other body really geared to such a discourse. And the reason it's able to carry out these functions effectively, adding value to the political process, is because of composition, both in terms of its political composition and its individual composition. Politically, no one party has a majority, an overall majority. The crossbenchers form roughly a quarter of the membership. No government can take its majority for granted. It therefore has to take the House seriously to work with it to get it to agree its measures. And this affects the culture of the House. The House of Commons has a culture of assertion. The House of Lords has a culture of justification. Ministers have to persuade the House. They have to justify their measures. They work with others beyond their own party. That culture is reinforced by the individual composition. It is primarily a house of experience and expertise. I distinguish between the two, but it is a house of experience and expertise. There are exceptions, but the house relies on those who know something about the subject. On second reading of the air traffic management and unmanned aircraft bill this year, Lord Rosser, speaking at the end of the debate from the opposition front bench observed, I appear unique in being able to speak in the debate without having any direct specialist knowledge or experience of the issues in the bill. He was conscious that those who had contributed really knew uh, about uh, air management and, and, and aircraft pilots, those who served as commercial airline pilots, area RAF pilots, there was a marshal of the RAF taking part, they knew their subject. So ministers have to take seriously those who clearly know what they're talking about. So in a nutshell, the work of the House adds value in a way that would not be possible or not likely to be possible with a different composition, and that's not trumped by the democratic argument for change. Now, there is a case for reform, but I would argue reform designed to strengthen the House in fulfilling its functions. 
as was mentioned in the introduction, um, I convened the campaign for an effective second chamber, which argues for reform within the House, reducing the size of the House and implementing changes to existing structures and procedures. And we have achieved change, not least through getting onto the statute book to private members bills. The House of Lords Reform Act 2014, allowing peers to retire, removing peers who never attend and removing any peer who commits a serious criminal offence. And the House of Lords Expulsion and Suspension Act 2015, which gives the House the power to expel a member and extends, has extended its power to suspend a member. We're now at the forefront of pressing to reduce the size of the House. We accept that we are too large. We should at the very least be no bigger than the House of Commons. So I believe the House is doing a good job, but we want to do it better. But it is a job or range of tasks that is particular to the existing House, which I would argue adds value to the political process without challenging the core accountability that is at the heart of our political system. Thank you. Thank you very much. There'll be lots, I'm sure, for um, us to discuss and lots of questions will be coming in as a result. Uh, perhaps if I could just kick off, could you explain very briefly how people are appointed to the House of Lords and how far is this in the gift of the Prime Minister or in party leaders and what is the role of the Appointments Commission? Yes, I mean, the challenge is your word briefly. Um, because there are two routes which you've touched upon. Um, one is the party route where the party leaders or the prime minister uh, decides there's time for fresh blood to be brought into the Lords and therefore will nominate peers and will either do it in a party capacity or may do it as prime minister. So peer, people who've held prominent public positions nominated and they go on to the uh, cross benches. The prime minister may invite other party leaders then to uh, nominate uh, a number of peers also. So that is the route. It's then up to whichever party to decide the criteria for appointments. When I was appointed, Tony Blair was prime minister, but I was nominated by William Hague, who felt it was appropriate, given the legislation going through the House, to have somebody there who knew something about constitutional issues. So there is that route. It's up to the parties to identify those who think they think would contribute to the work of the House. Um, in the campaign for an effective second chamber, we're quite keen to, if you like, up the process in terms of then the scrutiny of those who are nominated, because the nominations coming from number 10 do have to go through the Independent Appointments Commission for um, vetting, but that's for propriety, not for suitability. We'd like to extend the remit of the commission and if you like, up the uh, quality bar. The separate route is independent nomination. Anybody can nominate, one can self-nominate to go through the Independent Appointments Commission for being put forward uh, and therefore joining the cross benches. So a number of peers come in independent of government, um, although it has to go to the Prime Minister, but the nominations are made and then approved. And so one comes in through that route and that has helped increase the size of the cross benches. I would like to see more coming through uh, that route, but that's, as I say, independent of the process by which the Prime Minister will determine that more should come in. And you touched on this very briefly at the end, but how can someone be removed from the House of Lords if they've been found guilty perhaps of some kind of offence or misdemeanour? Yes, well in, until 2014 you could not be, membership was for life. You could only be removed by legislation, which obviously was exceptional, um, though not unprecedented. So uh, the 2014 Act uh, changed that. I drafted the, the bill, so I was particularly keen to bring it into line with the House of Commons when it came to any member committing an offence. So our rules now are the same as the Commons. Anyone convicted and sentenced to 12 months or more is automatically out. I mean, peers can now choose to retire, which again, they couldn't uh, before. And we also remove anybody who's not attended for a session as long as it's lasted for six months. The 2015 Act 
as I mentioned, expand, extends the power of suspension. We had it, but it was limited. But it has introduced the power of expulsion. The House can now expel uh, a member should it decide that they um, have acted in such a way that that is merited. Uh, and as you may be aware, that is about there's a motion coming before the House uh, for that. So members can now be removed from the House. Before it was a case of persuading them to not attend anymore. Now it's the power is there. So the House has the disciplinary powers it did not have before in relation to its members. And you said at the start that this debate often starts from an assumption that the House of Lords is undemocratic and that that's an assumption that you reject. So could I just push you a little bit mm. on that? Because I think quite a lot of the response that we get when we post on this kind of thing on Twitter is how can it be democratic to have a legislative assembly for which the people cannot elect members and cannot remove them? Yes, I normally when people say it's undemocratic, I ask them how they're defining democracy. And this is normally followed by silence. Um, because democracy, demos kratia, when you think about it, it's how we choose to govern ourselves. Um, so it's governing that is fundamental. And of course, it's the process by which we choose our governors. So in our system, we choose those governors through elections to the House of Commons. So there's just one direct route of choosing those who are going to form the government. They are elected by the people through elections to the House of Commons. They can be removed through elections to the House of Commons. So government is responsible for public policy. It can be held to account at the next election. If you start to elect a second chamber, which will then say, well, we're elected, we have legitimacy, we will choose to use the existing powers, which the House doesn't, um, to challenge something coming from the first chamber. So you might get a rather opaque decision-making process deals done and outputs which conflict with what the government has promised. You've then got the problem of who do you hold to account for those outputs? So um, there is no one body that stands before the electors as being responsible for the public policy that's been implemented between elections. So at the moment we have a government that has the, and the principle of collective responsibility is very important here, one entity, which is the party in government, standing as a defined entity to be responsible for what it's achieved or not achieved in office, electors can then remove it or reward it. If you start to divide that accountability between the two chambers, you lose that core accountability that is at the heart of our political system. So my view is at the moment, we have the advantage of what I've termed core, that core accountability, one body responsible for public policy, chosen by electors, removable by the electors, with the House of Lords not challenging that core accountability, but adding value in what it does to the work of the elected House through which the government governs. So we don't challenge the outputs. We might try and improve them, send them back to the Commons. The amendments are normally approved. If they're not, we generally do not insist. So it does not challenge that core accountability that potentially would be challenged if you have two elected chambers. Thank you. Perhaps just one final question mm. before we move on. Does the model that you've outlined um, of a house of expertise, a house that is not controlled by one party, a house that scrutinizes and, and so on, does that model depend upon the willingness of the government and particularly the prime minister to exercise a certain discretion in their appointments? Could you envisage a scenario in which a government appeared to be keen to tilt the party balance in the House of Commons, uh, perhaps to threaten it with moving it to York, perhaps to make appointments that might bring it into disrepute, in which you had to conclude that your model no longer was viable? There is a challenge. I mean, it'd be difficult to actually implement any of that. We're not moving to uh, York because I mean, the arguments against are such that nobody, I think, takes it dreadfully seriously. Um, and it would require the houses to agree to it. I mean, you're, you're right in the sense of a prime minister um, might be um, uh, a bit incontinent in terms of nominations, and, and that can be uh, a problem. Um, 
and you occasionally hear that, and of course it was used in, in 1910, 1911, the threat of creating so many new peers. Um, there are practical problems, um, not least in the time it takes to introduce uh, new peers, and the House, if it was so minded, could actually um, change the rules governing the introduction, because there's a difference between being made a peer and being introduced into the House of Lords. So ultimately, the, the, there are mechanisms that possibly could be uh, employed. So you've identified a problem. We are alert to that. We're very keen to press for restraint on the part of a prime minister. We're making, we were making progress when Theresa May was in number 10. Um, there was a discourse with her. The current prime minister has not been quite as restrained as we would have liked. Um, but that is something to which we're alert and would be keen to see uh, some changes. And indeed, our um, programme, which was embodied in an original House of Lords bill with all what we sought to achieve, we've managed to achieve bits of it through the private members' bills I've mentioned. So we hived off particular reforms and achieved those. Um, we would like to reform the independent appointments process and have a statutory formula that would limit the prime minister in terms of the number of nominations, both through the party route and then through the route as the prime minister, as prime minister. Thank you very much. I should say that there's a really fascinating discussion going on in the chat box relating to a lot of these issues. Um, I'll uh, return to some of the points that people have raised subsequently. But I'd like to move on now to our second speaker, who is also a member of the House of Lords, Baroness Grey Thompson. Before entering the House of Lords in 2010, Tanya Gray Thompson was one of the UK's most successful athletes. She has won 16 Paralympic medals, held more than 30 world records, and won the London Marathon six times. She's also a broadcaster, Chancellor of the University of Northumbria, and has served on the boards of the London Marathon, Transport for London, and the London Legacy Development Corporation. So she brings an enormous range of experiences and expertise to the house, where she sits as a crossbencher. She has spoken on a wide range of issues, including in opposition to cuts uh, to welfare payments in 2016. So thank you very much for joining us. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, one of the misconceptions about how I ended up in the House of Lords was that I was an athlete and then on retirement, um, I got elevated to the Lords. And um, that, that's partly true. Actually, I think I'll be honest, probably at least a third of my colleagues didn't even know I'd been an athlete. Um, but actually, while I was competing, um, I did lots of other things. Uh, and in terms of when I was nominated and went through the interview process, which you do as a crossbench peer, a lot of those things were taken um, into account. So in my early 20s, I sat on the National Disability Council, which was uh, the implementation body of the Disability Discrimination Act. Uh, I sat on Sport Wales, uh, I sat on UK Sport when the Lottery Act changed um, to allow um, funds into an elite athletes after the 96 Olympics and Paralympics and I sat on a number of different government reviews. Um, also, uh, I actually did a politics degree at university, although uh, I very grandly said in my head of departments just before I graduated, I'm never going into politics because that's for losers. Um, so some things come back to bite you. Um, so uh, I retired in 2007 and then I had the opportunity to enter the, the crossbench process. And I have to say, it is the weirdest interview I have ever had in my life for um, anything. So very early on, uh, one of the questions I was asked, what is the most interesting debate you've ever listened to in the House of Lords? And I mumbled some answer and actually the interview panel sort of just smiled. Um, and um, it, it was, I think it was one of those questions that was just designed to make you think. So actually, as a personal development process, it was amazing. My interview was about two hours long and they didn't particularly ask me about what I'd done. It was all about what um, I could potentially do in the future and what areas of interest and what expertise I could bring and what legislation I, I'd want to change if I had the opportunity uh, to do that. So um, I got through the process. Uh, the way I found out was an email on a Tuesday night, which just said on Friday, it'll be announced, you're in, that was it. My father's reaction was, well, it's still not a real job. So uh, thanks to dad for that. Um, but um, the, the process of going in was actually done very speedily because there was a real push to, to get, there were four of us appointed that year to get us in before the general election of 2010. So I had my introduction ceremony. 
Um, and actually for me, that was really good because I then had the period of the election to actually find my way around the building. So when you, did, you don't get a map when you join because of security. So you can always spot the new ones because you have that slightly confused look on your face. And people are very kind. It's, the most, it's one of the kindest and most open places I've ever worked. But it does get slightly tiring when people keep trying to direct you to the toilets and the cafes. Um, so um, the things that people don't think about is not every peer has a desk. The one thing that I would personally reform in terms of the way that we work is, is actually our daily working life. We don't have a staff. Uh, we don't have a team of people. I'm lucky that I got a desk. Um, and if I had a pound for every email I get, which was get a member of your staff to reply to me today, I'd be rich. Um, because the challenge of that is balancing what you, what I feel is my ever expertise and the areas that I'm interested in. And going from sport where everything was very, very tightly planned and worked out to the point that I knew two years ahead what time and date I'd be competing at a world championships or a Paralympics, I'm then, and this was the hardest bit for me to change in the first sort of year and a half was you, I, I think I was in a debate on a Tuesday and it might be the following Thursday. So just kind of planning things was, was really difficult. Um, but for me, um, the best advice I had was just sit in the chamber and listen and learn. And um, you've got the companion to the standing orders, which is okay to a point. But until you sit in the chamber and you just watch, then that is the, the best way of doing it. So the first really big bit of legislation I got involved in was the Welfare Reform Bill and then the Legal Aid uh, Punishment and Sentence and Offenders. And the thing that I learned very quickly is that um, things are put in legislation in different places and it's up to you to find out how they all join up. Um, and so with the Welfare Reform Bill, uh, I, my plan was I was gonna speak in the second reading and then I was gonna probably put my name to some amendments. And then I found that I was then had my name as the first name on amendments, then I was leading on amendments, and then I was leading on votes. And it was a pretty brutal way to learn. There's definitely mistakes I made in terms of there's one thing that I should have taken to a vote, which I didn't, but in all reality, it would have got overturned as soon as it had gone back to the Commons. Um, what I did find amazing in, in that legislation, I had a government peer who helped me rewrite my first amendment to make it stronger. And as he handed over the piece of paper, he said, and if you vote on it, I'm not voting with you because I think it's daft. Um, and I remember taking it away thinking, is he just winding me up here? Actually, he, he was genuinely trying to help me in terms of, because I think what, what I personally find as a crossbencher, people want to beat you when you're good. They, they, you know, they actually want to help you most of the time be the best you can be in, in kind of quite a, a sort of a fair fight. So um, the challenges that uh, we, we have in terms of how we're perceived from the outside, um, usually the pictures that are posted of us um, in any newspaper article is state opening, which is not real. Um, that is not what we do every day. We obviously get a lot of criticism for how we're paid, uh, and I won't go too much into the current arrangements, but I think while the current arrangements for being online has been amazing, actually we're going to face problems in the future in terms of the current way we're being paid because actually it's making it extremely difficult for those people who don't have a pension to be able to contribute on on an ongoing basis to the, the work of of the house of lords but the other bit of um advice i had which was great was just speaking debates that you know about so you know i, I do welfare reform i also did a lot of the 2012 legislation so when we were doing all the really boring stuff about road closures and sunday trading and all the things that would make the 2012 games work in the chamber, you have got Sebco, Olympian, politician, chair of the bid, Colin Moynihan, Olympian, who'd been chair of the British Olympic Association, Sue Campbell, who'd been chair of UK sport, Sue Masham, the first Paralympian to be in the House of Lords, she went, she competed at the 1960 Games. So you have people who've been there, seen it, know it's exactly what Lord Norton said, is that you're able to challenge the ministers um, in quite a different way. And certainly I've always found the ministers have always been really open and the build teams have always been really open to having discussions, testing things out, um, and being able to just really challenge them in an, in a, a very positive way. Um, some of the difficulties, uh, the, the best thing about being a crossbencher is nobody tells me how to vote. The hardest thing about being a crossbencher is that nobody tells me how to vote. And I do take that very seriously. I think if I can't explain in a couple of sentences why I voted a certain way, I shouldn't. Um, although very few people actually ask me that question. And, and what I've come to realise um, is that although I'm very paperless as an individual, not being present in the building um, is quite difficult at the moment in terms of you can get so much done over a cup of tea. Um, and I never realised the power of long table and afternoon tea 
where you have a cup of tea, piece of cake, but there you, you're basically forced to meet and talk to people that you wouldn't normally speak to. And there's so much that you can get done outside the chamber as, as well as in the chamber. So for me, a, an important lesson I've learned is, is all the different ways that you can possibly um, affect change. Um, I think I'm very privileged to, uh, to find a second career that I love, um, but I agree, we need reform. It's, it's not, if we're gonna be looking at, um, I went in at 40, um, if we're looking at bringing younger people in, we're asking people to give up the careers or to step away from their careers. Um, I think we have a, a huge amount of challenge in that. And um, somebody who was appointed relatively recently, uh, who, who actually stepped away from a very, very well-paid career, actually said that they didn't realise until they'd accepted it and been through the process that there was actually no pension policy. There was actually, didn't really realise the way, I mean, they probably should have asked that question. There were lots of assumptions about that. So if, if we're looking to, to fundamentally change the dynamics of the chamber, we do have to address these issues uh, and, and take it very seriously. Um, and the final thing I'm going to say is, is it comes back to what we're talking about our current way of operating. Um, it is incredible the way that the chamber has changed in the last six months in a way that we never ever would have changed uh, in terms of online um, debates. But that has changed in terms of how we're able to speak in amendments where previously you can just turn up and speak. As Lord Norton said, you know, there is no time limit on the things that we do. Now you'll have to put your name down, things are balloted, second readings are balloted. And for me, that fundamentally has changed the way that I'm able to input into legislation. Um, it's fine for the moment, but I would not want to see a chamber that carries on that way in the future, because actually I think one of our strengths is that you can just, you know, go and, and, and join in. Um, and, you know, in a place that hasn't really changed in several hundred years, uh, it's, it's amazing, some of the stuff we've done. The other thing I'm not particularly keen on is online voting. Uh, it's, it's very easy to do it. Um, that also means that there's a different pressure on how we vote and at what time we vote and also being able to have those conversations about was that good was that bad and and actually having a much wider understanding of why we're voting and I have to say there is something really powerful when you've got someone who is voting against benefits for disabled children when you can look them in the eye and see which way they walk and they walk past you um, and I think that actually in terms of the responsibility of the voting is something that I would like to return to as soon as we possibly can. Um, but then I'm going to stop talking there. Um, thank you very much and I'm really happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, just, just to follow on from your final point there about online voting. Um, you, you said that you would like to return to in-person voting as soon as possible, but while that isn't possible, do you think online voting should continue or would you rather that there was a system more you know, the house of commons for example has adopted mass proxy voting no i i just so the only thing that i've got in common with my fellow crossbenchers is that we're crossbenchers um the thing that sometimes is amazes me is when you you walk down one of the voting lobbies you go oh wow i agree with you on this okay so uh, i i like that um but no, I, I don't think proxy vote did. I think, um, I mean, the app and everything is developed at a real pace in terms of um, explanations and, um, uh, you know, we have longer to vote as well, which is really helpful in terms of um, just being able to actually check and double check what you're voting on. So um, I think that has, has been a help as well. Um, and the level of authentication to dial into the system, I think is very good. But, but actually it does mean that you can vote um, within 20 seconds, if you know how you're gonna vote. It's a very, very quick process where I think, although it's sometimes um, slightly inconvenient to have to uh, sort of trudge down the corridor, down the, the voting lobbies, I think that makes you think quite differently um, about how you vote as well. So I, I wouldn't want to, to have proxy voting and I just don't think that's, I don't think that suits us as a chamber and I don't think that should be brought in. Thank you. You also mentioned that one of the great pleasures of being a crossbencher is that nobody tells you how to vote, but that's also a challenge as well, especially when legislation is so complex. And I wonder what kind of support crossbenchers receive, other than the kind of informal conversations you discussed, either from uh, the library or in terms of support staff. So we have a convener, he's our boss, which is Lord Judge, and he has um, a staff of two people. Uh, who will send out indications of 
whether they think there may be a vote sometimes. I mean, what we, we don't have is we don't have the message um, to say there will be a vote on this. It, sometimes we get it, but very rarely um, in terms of what happens. I think what's happened in the last couple of years is that if crossbench is going to take a vote, they tend to send an email out to other crossbenchers with a brief explanation of the reason for the amendment and the impact that it's going to have. I think I've certainly in lockdown and we've as crossbenchers, I think we've seen more of that because you, you don't have those conversations. Um, in, and, and also um, accessing everything online, you know, being able to just nip to the printed paper office in the morning, get all the papers, look at the amendment, match it all up. It is much harder to do that online when you're doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, 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 I think it is slightly harder to keep track of, of those things. Um, not so much on legislation that you're working on, you're interested in, but if there's other votes, um, it's, it's sort of slightly harder to do that. Um, but that's, that's also, you know, it's part of the job, mm. you know, um, it's, it's just something that you just, there's lots of things about the Lords that you kind of accept is slightly strange because it's part of the privilege of working there. And I'm not sure if that's good or bad all the time, but um, yeah, I think there's there's things that I think you have to, ultimately you have to be true to yourself in terms of how you vote. Um, I remember there was an, an amendment on smoking in cars uh, with children, um, that the police and social responsibility bill. And there are times when you just think, I don't know. And I think it's better just to say I don't know and, and step away rather than vote one way or, or the other, because you, you can have a huge impact, you know, on, um, on what happens. I think that the other, sorry, very quickly, the thing that's really hard um, in, in lockdown is when there's very complicated amendments to amendments, that's much, much harder to do when you're sitting at home um, trying to track everything that's going on. And I have to say my family have quite mixed reactions to, it's great to be at home more. Um, they're slightly less impressed when I bring the debate to the dinner table and have the computer sitting in the corner. Um, you know, in, in the office, you watch it on the enunciator. That's what you do while you might be doing emails or other stuff. But yeah, my, my laptop now just follows me around the house and sort of intrudes on, you know, family time in quite a different way. One of the arguments that's sometimes made for an appointed chamber is that while it might not be democratic, it is representative. And I wonder, do you see yourself as representing particular constituencies? No, but I uh, I get emails on certain issues. So I get a lot of emails on um, health and social care, disability benefits, sport, uh, duty care in sport. Those so sort of things that I speak on. Um, I try to be really clear with people if they write asking for help. And there's only, you know, we don't have time to do casework. There's a few things that you can help with, but the vast majority of the time you can't. I try to be really clear with people if that's completely outside my area of interest, if I really don't know the subject. Um, and try and direct them to, to people that do. Um, so that I think is, is quite, in terms of actually just the personal responsibility that you feel mm -hmm. when, when somebody is, uh, and at the moment it's, it's a lot of emails that we're getting um, about those issues. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. I just, um, I don't know how Lord Norton feels, but at the moment it feels we're just drowning in, in emails uh, and just, just, just trying to keep track of stuff, which is always, you know, there's always challenges around it, but the last six months have felt much more challenging than they normally do in, in terms of trying to keep track of all those different things. And perhaps just one final question for now. Um, as, as you've touched on, you uh, spoke out against welfare cuts in the previous, uh, the previous government. And, you know, as someone who's family members were affected by that. I personally was very grateful for that. But I, I wonder how you would respond to somebody who said that ultimately it has to be for the elected house to decide on questions of public expenditure and you know where cuts are, are made and where money is spent. And that it, it must be for the represent the elected representatives to make those decisions rather than for an unelected chamber. But it, it kind of is, you know, there's there's some things we can only send back certain amount of times. Um, you know, ping pong, the first time you do it, it's quite exciting. Uh, and, and and then, you know, I, I think certainly all the peers that I work with take their responsibility really seriously. Um, I remember when there was a big furore around tax cuts, uh, was that 2011? And uh, the Chancellor, uh, George Osborne, 
sort of was very public about the House Lords are, you know, overstepping their role. We we have clerks, we have a number of people who who are very clear with us what our role is, and certainly the people I work with take them, you know, send in amendments back to the Commons very seriously. But ultimately, they do have, you know, that that power. I, I I just say to people, you know, it's our job just to say to the government of the day, are you really sure this is what you want to do? Do you want to have another think about it? And ultimately, you know, we, we are not there to run the country. We are there just to, you know, check and challenge. And I do think um, if we went to um, elected house, I'm not against it, but it's it's actually how that is made up. Because if we, or if a peer or a senator, whatever they're called, had a larger constituent than an MP, then I think then, you know, senators would want to run the country because you, you can argue how. So I think it's a really easy argument to say we're not democratic. Um, I think what you put in its place needs to be really carefully thought out that you just don't have a mirror image of uh, the commons because, you know, coming back to the question on diversity, if, if you look at the people in the chamber, you know, when there's a debate on beekeeping, there's six peers who keep bees or, you know, it's, um, you know, which matters to people who keep bees, you know, it's that, that and, and there are people like me, in my, my political home is quite confused, you know, depending what the, the subject is, depending where I am. I've, I've never been a member of a political party, I kind of really struggle, my view over time changes. So, you know, I'm not saying, you know, keep it just because, of people, but, but the advantage I think of, some of the advantage of what we have at the moment is people who naturally wouldn't go into politics, but have a view of politics uh, and, and want to engage with politics are able to do it in a way that you just can't in the commons. It is really, really difficult as an independent um, to, to, to be a member of parliament. So, uh, you know, you've got people like Baroness Campbell Surbiton who, you know, again, there's disability rights. Some would just, you know, the, an elected chamber is just not the, the place to, to, to suit uh, an awful number of people. So I think it comes back to the diversity, you know, I, I look around the chamber um, and yeah, it does look like, you know, a lot of older white men, but actually you start looking at educational background and job and all the things people have done in their lives. And just, I remember coming out of a debate where I had a very minor disagreement um, with Lord Joffe and somebody had said, oh, you know, house laws full of old white blokes, just get rid of them all. Who's that bloke? And like, Joel Joffe, yeah, what's he done? It was a whole human rights law. Yeah, well, what's he really done? Well, he's the guy that, pretty much single-handedly got Nelson Mandela off the death penalty. And he's like, ah, okay, he can stay. Yeah. And that, that's not, you know, not everyone comes with that kind of background, but, you know, I, th I think it's, I, I think we've got a real job to do in terms of actually explaining to people what the House of Lords is and what we do, mm -hmm. how we're made up. Because actually, I think, I did meet one MP who actually didn't know what we did, but anyway, that's another story. Um, so I, I think we've got a bit of a job to do in terms of explaining what our job, and our job is not to run the country. So, so that's actually a point that several people have raised in the chat box, which is really interesting about how we communicate what the House of Lords does. Um, so we might come back to that. Uh, but I'd like to move now to our final panellist, who is not yet a member of the House of Lords, but I'm sure it's only a matter of time. Um, but she is one of the leading academic authorities on the subject and a walking encyclopedia on how Britain is governed. Professor Meg Russell is Professor of British and Comparative Politics at University College London. She is also the director of the Constitution Unit. And if you don't follow the Constitution Unit on Twitter or subscribe to its mailing list, it is an absolute fount of good sense on the Constitution and does a wonderful job of explaining how the British system works. She was a consultant in 1999 to the Royal Commission on Reform of the House of Lords. She has acted as an advisor to the House of Lords Appointments Commission and the Lord Speaker's Committee on the Size of the House. And she's the author, among other works, of books on reforming the House of Lords, lessons from overseas, and the contemporary House of Lords. So we couldn't be in better hands. So over to you. Thank you, Robert, for that incredibly warm opening. And thank you for the invitation to speak at this excellent event. Um, you asked me to focus primarily on the reform questions. So I was going to try and very quickly address three questions. Um, why has the House of Lords not been reformed? If we're thinking about reform, what can we learn from uh, two chamber parliaments in other countries? And where might we go next with reform? 
Um, Robert, as an excellent historian, has actually stolen some of my best lines at the outset about how House of Lords reform is always with us. It's rare that you have a government that doesn't have a House of Lords reform agenda. Um, and that wonderful line about the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle of British politics, which I believe comes from the founder of the Myland Institute, Peter Hennessy, who always has a fantastic turn of phrase. So Lords reform is always with us um, and it never goes away. Why is this? I would say one, one thing is important, and you also referred to this, Robert, to an extent, that actually the House of Lords has been reformed quite often. It's just been reformed in very small steps. So the Parliament Acts 1911 and 1949, which removed the veto and then reduced the delaying power, the Life Peerages Act 1958, uh, which allowed people to be appointed for their lifetimes without passing their uh, titles on to their children, um, the House of Lords Act uh, 1999, which removed the great majority of hereditary peers, and then the 2014 Act, which Philip Norton referred to allowing people to retire. So we have actually seen quite a lot of reform. If we look at the House of Lords now, it is a very, very different institution to what it was at the beginning of the 20th century when it was full of men who were inheriting their titles um, and who would pass those titles on to others. It's a much more diverse institution now. Um, but I think that the, the, the sense that it hasn't been reformed is reinforced by some of the failed larger reforms. So we have had various attempts at large scale reform. Harold Wilson back in the 1960s, complete failure. Um, and more recently after the 1999 reform, we had a whole stream of white papers coming from the government. We had a Royal Commission that you referred to. We've had joint committees of both chambers thinking about what the next step should be and nothing ever happening. Um, and why is that? At the beginning, the Royal Commission's proposals, which were for a minority elected House majority appointed, were seen as too timid, not democratic enough. Um, and so gradually there was a sort of bidding war upwards for how what proportion of the House should be elected until we got to a point under Nick Clegg where it was going to be David Cameron and Nick Clegg, it was going to be 80 to 100% elected, at which point people said, no, 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 that's too democratic, that's too legitimate, uh, we don't want that. So there's lots of disagreement um, within political parties and between political parties um, about the direction that we should take. One of the conf confounding factors, I think, is that the last small scale reform we saw in 99 to remove the hereditary peers slightly unexpectedly made the House of Lords feel much more confident in challenging the government. It felt more legitimate because it was more party balanced, despite being entirely unelected. Um, it caused the government quite a lot of headaches, and that made them much that, that made them cautious about pushing in the direction of giving it greater kind of legitimacy um, and democratic underpinning. What can we learn from other countries? Well, one of the crucial things I learned when you know some of these things are completely unexpected, and it's it's very good to widen your horizons in this way. The House of Lords is not by any means the only controversial second chamber in the world. In fact, nearly all second chambers are controversial. And that's not just the unelected ones, it's the elected ones as well. And we're not the only people to be embroiled in an endless conversation about how to reform the second chamber. These reform debates are going on in countries all over the world with all sorts of differently constructed second chambers. So this right takes you to the question, what are second chambers for? Why do we have them at all? Um, well, I think they're really important institutions, particularly in large and complex and diverse democracies. Um, they avoid us taking political decisions too quickly without thinking them through. They require second thought um, in the policy process. And they also bring different perspectives to bear in the policy process. They bring contrast to the voice of the first chamber. But that takes you to a central conundrum about bicameralism, two chamber parliaments, that if you have two chambers that agree, that seems fairly pointless. But if you have two chambers that disagree, that's clearly problematic. Um, and it's often the second chamber that gets the blame in both cases. Second chambers are what um, Patterson and Mugen, two academics in a nice book published about 20 years ago, re referred to as essentially contested institutions. So if we're designing a second chamber, if we're thinking about reform, we want one which is different to the first chamber. There's no point simply replicating the first chamber. 
it needs to, in some sense, represent a different dimension of legitimacy, a different kind of logic um, to have a, have a competing legitimacy. And, and what, what sort of thing could that be? Well, if you look around the world and you think about what, we, what might be applicable in, in the UK case, one alternative logic would be a logic of proportionality. So we have a, ma a majoritarian House of Commons and people you know, complain quite often that the, the electoral system isn't proportional. If you look to Australia, uh, the House of Representatives in Australia is rather similar to the House of Commons and they elect their second chamber on a proportional basis. That gives you a nice contrast, a nice kind of tension. I, that's, that's been the basis uh, partly for some of the reform proposals in the UK, but one of the problems there, I think, is that we actually have a very contested electoral system. And it does raise the possibility that the second chamber being proportional would be seen as more legitimate than the first chamber, which doesn't really happen in Australia. Another logic is the territorial logic. We've heard a lot of talk in the UK about the possibility of a second chamber of the nations and regions that reflects devolution in some way. There are lots of examples of that around the world. The classic one is Germany, where the second chamber represents the governments, but you've also got lots of other countries um, where the second chamber represents the parliaments or the people of different geographic areas. That's a possibility for the UK, but our devolution settlement is very untidy and you get into awkward questions about who would represent England, how you would represent it, and also dif difficult questions that you see in countries such as Spain, that the separatist parties really don't want to go along with this kind of model. So I don't think the SNP wants to sign up to a stronger kind of federal second chamber. They want Scottish independence. The third kind of logic you might apply is the one that we currently have, uh, of expertise. I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. And an interesting example is Canada, um, where the, 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 the Canadian Senate is also appointed by the Prime Minister, um, but its size is strictly limited. And in recent years, the Prime Minister has handed over his appointment powers to an independent commission, which appoints only people who are free, of, free from political party. Um, and I think that's done the Canadian Senate a lot of good. So there are things that we can learn there. You can also, of course, mix these formulas up. You can have part elected, part appointed, part territorial, part expert. And this is what some of the proposals in the UK over the years have sought to do. But the risk there is, of course, you end up pleasing nobody. So in short, thinking about uh, the House of Lords reform requires you to confront some quite big questions about the constitution, electoral systems, territorial representation, etc. To do that job properly requires a big thinking process, sitting down with a blank piece of paper, some quite deep thinking, ideally a lot of public engagement through maybe something like a citizen's assembly. That is a big job. Until then, until we've sorted that out, I do think there are other things that we can do. And if you look back at the history of Lord's reform, what has happened has been small incremental steps. Those have succeeded while large scale reform never has. So I think the thing we need to do is ask ourselves, what is the urgent next step now? It's already been referred to. Um, the one I think is the most urgent next step is the size of the House of Lords, which is ever spiraling upwards and the unregulated appointment power of the Prime Minister. We passed a rather depressing anniversary last year. It was 300 years since the first bill that sought to restrict the number of peers that could be appointed by the monarch. I think it's well past time that we did that. Another thing that we could do is end the hereditary peer by-elections, um, which I think don't do the reputation of the House of Lords any good. But there is a conundrum here if you ask yourself, where are the campaign groups calling for these changes? They don't actually exist because people see small scale reform as a threat to achieving the large scale reform that they want. When in fact, small scale reform is the only thing that has ever happened. And if you think that you should sit and wait while the House of Lords gets less legitimate and less respected because you're waiting for the perfect reform to come along, I think you're making a huge mistake because if we consistently see the legitimacy um, and the um, reputation of the House of Lords eroded, we are eroding the effectiveness of Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lots that we can think about there. Can I just develop a point you raised about 
the mechanism we should use if we were going to reform the House of Lords, how should we do it? Because there are plenty of people who might favour reform, but who might not trust this government or perhaps another government to do it. The coalition tried to create a sort of consensus within the House of Commons and that turned into a fuss. Um, the process you described of citizens assemblies and so on is a very long running and, and complex process. How do we do this? I think it's really difficult for the reasons that I already indicated and you see this in countries around the world. So, for example, the Canadians have been have also been engaged in a kind of century long debate about how to reform their Senate. And what you see is that when they sit down and have these conversations, it gets very tangled up in their case with um, the arguments about territory in Canada, about sort of uh, about independence for Quebec and so on. Second Chamber sits so it's so much at the heart of constitutions that you can't really talk about changing them without having quite big thoughts about the system as a whole. And of course, the bigger your landscape gets, the harder it gets to make decisions. So, you know, I mean, this, you could look at this like the argument about having a written constitution. You know, we talk about whether we should move towards having a written constitution, how you would actually get from A to B is a very, very challenging question. It would be a huge process. And actually, as I say, you know, second chamber reforms very often fail for these reasons and like constitutions you know it'll often be a point of crisis that actually finally forces people into a decision we don't really want a point of crisis you know we want to steer away from that and i think that where you do see reform around the world and where you've seen reform in the uk it has been more that sort of chipping away thinking right what's the next thing that we can do um, to improve this institution in an incremental way. Let's do that, see the effect of that, and then move on to the next thing and the next thing. So I started out as a radical reformer for the Lords, um, and I haven't necessarily lost sight of the, um, the ends, it's the means. Um, and I think you, you, know, you, can, you can be in principle in favor of incremental reform, but I'm in favor of incremental reform purely pragmatically because I think it's actually the only thing that's ever worked. So that actually raises a, an issue that someone brought up on Twitter before the event, which is that like so much of the British constitution, the House of Lords is of course a pre-democratic institution, which has been patched in order to make it compatible with democracy. But is there a point at which that approach simply runs out of road or does it always mean that the House of Lords will be dragged along behind democracy as a kind of break on it? And do we actually need to say we need to rethink the first principles of not just the Lords, but its relationship with the Commons? Mm. I think that's really interesting. And it, it, it's, it's consistent with what I said, I think, about uh, drawing in terms of drawing a parallel between Lord's reform and moving to a written constitution, because of course there's so much in our constitution, you know, things about the power of the power of the prime minister, the role of the queen, etc., which has never really been bashed out and written down, and some of these things look increasingly under pressure. Um, but the House of Lords, you know, it, it, yes, like everything else, it predates democracy, but it has continually changed in response to circumstances, you know, like in line with our, our flexible constitution in general. I think there is a possibility that we could kind of run out of road, um, but I think that would be forced on us by crisis. And I, I think if we don't keep going with the incremental reforms, you know, I mean, I, Philip was rather polite about um, the prime minister's appointment. Um, <laughs> appointment record. Um, I roundly condemned the appointment of 36 peers uh, by Boris Johnson, which tore up in effect the agreement that had been made between Theresa May and the committee uh, appointed by the Lord Speaker to keep control on the size of the House. I think that was disgraceful. Um, I think we need to legislate to constrain the Prime Minister's powers. But if we don't, if we don't embrace that because we think we want a wholly elected Senate, I don't think that's going to lead very quickly to a wholly elected Senate. It's a kind of scorched earth strategy, which is going to gradually destroy the House of Lords, um, destroy um, or seriously damage the kind of scrutiny role of Parliament in general. And therefore, I think we should be seeking to maintain an effective second chamber. Sorry, I've stolen Philip's nine and I'm not a member of his group, but um, 
I, I think we ought to be seeking to do what we can uh, to protect Parliament and to maintain a strong Parliament, whilst at the same time as maybe thinking about more radical reforms for the future, if, if that point ever arrives. And one last question before I bring everybody back in, which is that we had a major intervention on this subject by a former Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, in the New Statesman last week, uh, who said that the House of Lords should be reconstituted as a Senate of the nations and regions. And I see Lord Norton is uh, raising his eyebrows. And I think you indicated, Professor Russell, that you're not keen on that idea either. Could you say a little bit more about what you think the problems with that model would be? necessarily not keen on it it's just you've got to get beyond the slogan um and the you know and to, just to throw out another cliche you know the devil is in the detail it's all very well to say we want a chamber of the nations and regions but what do we mean how are we going to divide seats up between the different nations and regions who is going to be represented will it be the people the parliaments the governments what do we do about england um, where, you know, we've got a rather messy kind of tapestry of different arrangements with city mayors and so on, plus the GLA. Um, and a lot of England doesn't really have any sub-national um, body that could re readily be represented. And I think a lot of the reform proposals that we've had, going all the way back to the Royal Commission, have tried to square this circle by saying that the representation in the elected part um, of the second chamber, if, if it's a mixed chamber, which is what most of them have proposed, should be based on sort of large territorial areas. So you'd have Scottish members, Welsh members, Northern Irish members, and then you'd have the English regions represented. I think that's a reasonable proposition. Um, but the only means that you can really do that in a c consistent way between the different areas is to have them directly elected because you know, if you could ask the Scottish Parliament to elect people, but you, there's nothing in the northeast of England that could do the same. So it gets messy. That's 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 my real point. Um, and we need to come up with something that's workable that can be introduced now and perhaps improved upon over time. And nobody's really ever reached agreement as to what that should be. Thank you. Well, we've had lots of suggestions in the chat box and the Q&A and online for reforms in which people are interested. So what I'd like to do is to just run through some of them and invite you perhaps not to comment on all of them, but to comment on any that you think are particularly interesting or that you would like to respond to. So firstly, we've had some support on Twitter for the idea of sortition. The idea that people are picked to serve in the Lords by ballot in the same way that they are picked to do jury service. So I wonder what you think of that idea. Um, a second proposal um, is for fixed terms, that appointed members should only serve for, say, 10 years, and perhaps that term not be renewable. Thirdly, we've been asked um, whether there is a way of linking the House of Lords to citizens' juries or citizens' assemblies, so that we have a more directly participatory element that is linked to Westminster. And then, um, although... Lord Norton, I think, um, disapproved of the idea. We do have quite a lot of support for moving the House of Lords to York or to the north of England. And so I wonder if any of you would like to comment on that. So perhaps if we go in the same order um, again and just respond to whichever you would like to. Uh, you're muted. I'm unmuted. Um, oh gosh, where to start, particularly on the last one. Um, um, there are problems with moving per se, never mind. Uh, whether it's to York. Um, I mean, the argument put forward is, oh, well, it developed the links with the people. That's the last thing it would do. It would strengthen the executive, because if you move the Lords, but leave the Commons where it is, you've got a problem of communication between the two chambers. Uh, the links are extremely important. I mean, earlier, Baroness Gray Thompson was talking about the importance of members mixing together in the Lords. That's so vital to know what is going on. Sorry, um, you, you, things happen very quickly. Um, you need to be able to have a discourse with fellow members, but it's particularly important in a bicameral legislature, the links between the two chambers, to be able to communicate with members of the other house about what's happening to liaise. Now, if you physically separate by quite a large distance the two chambers, you've got problems. So easier for the government to play one off against the other. You're not really engaging with the other house so there's that i mean there are lots of other problems uh, as well because we are where we are because 
Parliament's where it is because of government is where it is. Government, the purpose of Parliament is to respond to the executive. You can't take it um, in a vacuum. Parliament exists to respond to demands of the executive for supply and for legislation. So, and of course, um, we're a parliamentary system, ministers are drawn from and remain within Parliament. So it's not just where the two houses are, it's where government is. So you have that linkage that's vital uh, uh, as well. Um, so the problems we're gonna, you know, if we moved to sort of the problems that Brandis Gray Thompson was talking about at the moment when we're operating remotely. Um, so there's a problem in we need to be together because of where government is. Um, so there are problems then in terms of um, discourse with civil society of meeting people because you're not easily accessible in the way you are in London. London is accessible. People can come to Parliament fairly easily. York is not that accessible for different parts of the country. Um, it's not a transport hub. Um, so there are all sorts of practical problems um, with, with moving, but there are problems with moving per se in relation of being a, a parliament um, and its links with the uh, executive. Now, you could, make a, you could make a perfectly valid argument for moving the whole of parliament and the executive out of London so we'd have sort of our own capital equivalent to Brasilia or Bonn, that sort of thing. So that could work. It'd be enormously expensive. And that's why I think people wouldn't go along with it, because you'd still have to maintain the powers of Westminster for all sorts of reasons. And um, so there's a, quite a logical argument for that, but not for splitting up the two chambers and putting one you know, a long way from the other and presumably a long way from government. So although we've made great strides in modes of communication not necessarily coming together physically um, we still need to be physically coterminous with the commons and the two chambers need to be close to uh, government because otherwise it won't work thank you baroness cray thompson thank you i mean i joked about having moving parliament to darlington which is close to where i live uh, but I, I totally agree with Lord Norton. It's, it's not just the two chambers. I mean, we've proved we can do ping pong, we can function, you know, fairly well, but it's actually having access to the different civil servants, the government departments, you know, some of the stuff where you might suddenly get a phone call saying, can you come to number 10 in half an hour? Um, you know, and, and it's, it's that that you miss. So it's kind of the presenteeism. So, you know, uh, it's, it's easy to talk about how much, you know, the uh, restoration of parliament's going to cost. Um, but one of the things that's been talked about is a new build. You go, okay, but actually, if we went into a new build, you wouldn't tolerate the working to conditions, you know, that people work in corridors or in the library or, you know, hot desk in. There's a number of peers I know who've got like a bit of a cabinet to put their stuff in. You know, I, I, I don't want a massive office of my own, but but actually, you know, Wi-Fi that works would sometimes be, used. I mean, it's actually that, I shouldn't joke, that has got significantly better. Um, I'm not sure pulling, you know, ultimately names out of a hat is terribly useful. Um, I think lots of people would want to do it. Lots of people wouldn't want to do it. And a year is not enough. Um, you know, even with my background, it takes, it takes time to, to learn the policies, the procedures, the language, the building the people. Um, and um, I, I would be in favor of um, a fixed term limit. Um, I think 10 to 15 years, because then actually people know what they're letting themselves in for. But one of the strengths of, I think at the moment, is that you're not expected to hit the ground running straight away. You're expected to hit the run ground running fairly quickly, but you have time to find the right legislation to work on. So actually, I, um, but if we have a fixed term limit, then we've also got to address pay, staff, office space, pensions, because we, we just like to pretend none of that happened. We're just, you know, and, and we shouldn't really get a lot of sympathy about the way we're paid at the moment. And to be honest, the way we're paid to most individuals, that's a huge amount of money, but Again, sorry, people forget that actually that's to cover our accommodation if you don't live in London and traveling around London and, and all those different things. It's um, And back in 2012, because the legislation I worked on, I worked out that actually what I got paid for a year's work was about four and a half thousand pounds after I paid all my research and the staff time I needed and things like that. And, and so that comes back to diversity, whether people can afford it. It, it, it just opens up loads and loads of questions that if we're going to do this, we, we need to actually be really open and honest um, about how this works. And there was a question about functional constituencies, which I just thought was really interesting because I share an office with a palliative care professor uh, and a professor of veterinary science. I 
I'm not a professor, so I feel slightly out of it, but you know, we do through the crossbench route and, and through the, the part, we do have lots and lots of different representation. Um, and if you're in, it's worth, you know, looking at people's declaration of interest and looking at the different areas that they bring. And certainly with the crossbench route, how it works is every year, um, they look at who's, who's in the chamber, who's working, what are their areas of interest and where those gaps need to be filled. So I, the year I came in, um, basically a disability rights campaigner had recently passed away and they needed somebody who understood the 2012 legislation. So I ticked two boxes. If that had been another year, would I have got in? I don't know. But, but at that time, I kind of fitted the box of what, what they needed. So um, I think some of that's really, can it be better? Yeah, it can be. Um, and I think, um, you know, where we're talking about retirement, some of the retirement uh, things that are now in place are much, much better. Um, but I still think there's a little bit more we need to do in terms of people who just never come, um, you know, and actually moving them on. I think that would be possible because that, if nothing, would get our number. It's really easy to go, oh, there's 800 members. You know, how many people actually work either in their area of specialist interest and that's when they come in and that's fine because that's when they should come in or are kind of have it as a working title. And that, if we can get closer to that number, I think that would just help us quite a lot, to be honest, because it doesn't do us any favours when it's, whatever the number is it's you know it it makes us look slightly ridiculous thank you me yes <laughs> um I, I agree with all of that and i don't want to extend this too much so we should get back to some other questions on the fixed terms i i agree there are merits in that but they need to be long and that's been one of the difficulties that's um, got in the way of introducing elections. That the suggestion has always been that the terms that people are elected for should be long terms, because the last thing you need is to introduce an ethos in the House of Lords where people are constantly thinking about the next election and they're out on the doorstep, because MPs do that and they do it fine. And the reason that peers have got so much time to think about the detail of legislation is because they're not doing those things. You need complementarity between the chambers. But then you say, well, let's elect people for 10 or 15 years. And people say, well, hold on, that's not very democratic. What about accountability? So that goes back to my point about these conundrums where you want different logics and you want to feel that the chamber is sufficiently legitimate without becoming a carbon copy of the first um, chamber. Um, on the sortition point, that is a really interesting point, but it, you can connect it up, can't you, to the length of terms. You can't simply pluck people randomly out of the population and insist that they serve in a second chamber for 10 or 15 years. You know, you might be able to do that for juries for a couple of weeks, but you cannot do that for 15 years. And unless you have a degree of coercion uh, for people to do it, then you're gonna end up with a, with a fundamentally unrepresentative group of people who are prepared to do it. So you're slightly back to where you started. Um, I've worked a, a fair bit, the Constitution Unit's done quite a lot of work on citizens assemblies and designing them well is difficult. You need to give people incentives, you need to ensure that you very carefully make sure that they're representative in terms of gender, ethnicity, area of the country, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the best way to do that with respect to the second chamber is probably the point that I don't think either of the other two panelists did respond to, which was working more closely with citizens assemblies. So maybe working alongside citizens assemblies. They're looking at ideas like this in Belgium in terms of having, um, a, a, having a body which is kind of constantly renewed, which is informing parliament, but which isn't parliament. And that might be uh, more practical. And on York, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, the, um, the, the, the extent of informal contact and how that makes parliament and politics work really cannot be overestimated. And I would simply throw in that of all of the second chambers around the world, I think there are something like 76 bicameral parliaments at the moment. There is only one in the world where the two chambers are in different cities. That's in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and they introduced bicameralism a couple of years ago, so it's an experiment, but it hasn't been tried elsewhere and I wouldn't recommend it. Thank you very much. Um, for the next round of questions, perhaps we could go in reverse order. Um, and th these are slightly larger questions of, of principle. Uh, firstly, a number of people have, have asked about how we represent youth. That you know, many of the big questions being debated in politics at the moment relating to climate change, relating to Brexit and so on, are going to be particularly affect the young. And yet a house of experience or expertise is likely to find it hard 
to have a, a youthful membership. Is there any way in which we could or should be trying to bring more young people into the House of Lords? Uh, secondly, even if we don't go the full hog of the Senate of Nations and Regions, are there ways in which the House of Lords could make the devolved settlement and its relationship with Westminster work better? And then thirdly, we've got a broader question that's not so much about the working of the House as about actually the principle of the peerage, that if democracy is fundamentally about the political equality of all citizens, is it appropriate to have a group of people who have special titles and forms of address? So with apologies to two of our panellists, are barons and baronesses appropriate in a democratic society? So Professor Russell, would you like to kick us off on any of those? Um, well, one thing I would do, and I'm not sure my other panelists will agree with this, um, is I would separate the peerage from membership of the second chamber, because I think quite often these things get muddled up. People want a peerage because they want to be a peer, because they, I mean, some of them, some people want the title and they don't want to do the work. Some people want to do the work and they may or may not want the title. So I think just to simplify things, we could divide the two. We can maintain an honour system, but we should have a working um, parliament. Um, in terms of youth, I think that's a really, really tricky one um, because, you know, if you ask yourself um, where, I mean, we don't have a Senate, but many countries around the world have a Senate or a House of Senators or that kind of thing. What does that mean? Um, it means that people are mature and have experience. You know, it's the same root as the word senior. Um, so it's, it's quite inherent in what second chambers are that they're a place of second thought, of kind of wise counsel. But I appreciate as well that um, young people feel quite shut out. So I guess the question is, do you do that through um, some sort of reserved seats in the second chamber or do you do it through some other kind of mechanism which maybe sits alongside Parliament? I would say actually going back to something that um, Tani Gray Thompson said about the functional constituencies, which is kind of a related point. This is all about representation and representativeness, increasing the representativeness. Um, I think strengthening the role of the House of Lords Appointments Commission is really necessary because actually, you know, Philip referred to the two routes into the chamber, uh, one as a party political appointee of a party leader and the other through the House of Lords Appointments Commission route, which Baroness J. Gray Thompson used. The fact is that very few people are getting in through that second route at the moment. They're getting crowded out by the political appointees and the political appointments are completely unregulated. So a prime minister can appoint as many people as he or she wants with any party balance that they want. And those people can be more or less anybody that they want. Uh, you know, they could be all men. They could be all from London, you know, whatever. There is no way of stopping that. So it's been discussed for years how the House of Lords Appointments Commission ought to have more of a role in sort of setting targets in being able to send lists back to party leaders saying, no, I'm sorry, they can't all be men. And actually that way you could get some of this functional role as well, because I think the House of Lords Appointments Commission takes that really seriously. They really think about diversity amongst their appointees. They try and get people from different parts of the country, different demographics, different expertise in different topics, but they control a very small percentage of the membership. And if we could extend those principles across the wider membership by regulating the political appointments more, I think that would be definitely a step in the right direction. Thank you. Baroness Gray Thompson. Thank you. Um, I mean, in terms of bringing younger people um, into the chamber, um, there has been a move over the years. The trouble is, as all of us get one year older, it doesn't always really help the average age, which I think is either 69 or 70. Um, and, you know, there's one way we're all going. So, you know, I'm, I'm still 19 years off the average age. Um, so, uh, you know, we had Lord Way who came in, he was 33. I think in the last tranche, there were some younger people. It, there is a little bit, and, and yes, that youth voice is really important and how it's represented, but there's an element of will people choose to give up a career to actually work in the House of Lords the way it is and the, way it's, and the way it's just structured. You know, and some of that commitment that, you know, an awful lot of peers don't live in London. When I chose to go into this level of politics, you know, my commitment is I'm home, away from home, four nights a week, 45 weeks of the year. And um, when I went in, my daughter was seven years old. So actually she got dragged around the bill. I mean, she sat on the welfare reform bill, 
somebody was tweeting one day, oh my God, who has brought a child to welfare reform? And it was like, it was me. Um, and she sat in the chamber for five hours. So, you know, um, so I, I don't think that it's, not, the youth voice is not, rep, it's not, it's not represented because we have all party groups. The, we have a huge range of ways. It's just the average age doesn't help in terms of how it looks in terms of um, the, the numbers. And so, and I think there would be, you know, if people would be happy, you know, it's not we're against having young people. It's just actually for a lot of the time you have to have had your career to, to want to work in the system that it's there. Um, totally with Professor Russell on changing the titles. I mean, I just find it slightly bizarre. And, um, you know, it's it's kind of easy for the staff because they have to call us my lord or lady because there's loads of us and it's just an easy way to do it. But I would absolutely separate um, the, the work of the second chamber from the, the peer system. And to be honest, the next time we get any hereditary legislation, I'm putting amendments in to take away the titles for wives because it really annoys me. So if you're the wife of a sir, you're a lady. If you're the daughter of a duke, you're a lady. If you're a baroness, you're a lady. So I get the same title as, as the wife, as the possession of somebody else. And um, when I went in, somebody said to me, oh, were you one of those feminists who campaign in for titles for their husband? Because if that happens, there'll be thousands of them. Well, there's not that many women in the Lords anyway. But, but I do find the titles strange. What I don't think the title is strange is in the chamber where you have to call, you know, the noble Lord and, you know, it gives you time to calm down before you kind of rant at somebody. So I think the use of title is, is very handy in, in, in terms, and I, that also makes it inaccessible to people outside if you don't watch it all the time. So the use of the title is handy, but the title is just strange. Thank you. Right. Um, well, just on that last point, I don't want to digress too much, but I do have the answer to that particular problem. My solution is that the spouse would just become the honourable. So that that would work through, that would be consistent. So you knew perfectly well who'd got the honour and then the spouse was the honourable. So you wouldn't have the problems we have now, which is both that some people get a title and of course some people don't. So if you're a baroness, your husband doesn't get a title. Um, so that, that's by the way. Um, I, uh, I, I take Meg Russell's point and indeed Baroness Great Thomas. You could separate the peerage and membership. I suspect the way we might go in a practical sense is actually to have, you might still carry on with legislative peerages but have non-legislative peerages because Meg Russell is is quite right some people do it essentially for the uh the title um to find some way of hiving that off because the people you want in the house are those who are going to contribute to the work of, of uh the house and I think that's absolutely crucial and um, I'll address the one question um on the then the devolution one um because I think the present way of operating actually can accommodate that in a fairly flexible way, because you've already got that. We've got members drawn from each part of the uh, United Kingdom without having it too rigid. So it gives you a degree of flexibility to take into account where people are uh, coming from. To some extent, it's, it's different parts of England that don't necessarily have people drawn from them uh, who come into the Lords. Um, though, to say how many peers live in London might be misleading because once you go to a peerage, the Lords is in London. So people perhaps move to London. Um, uh, but the point about um, it is that you can have members from different parts of the United Kingdom while retaining that sense of unity as a chamber because we don't have evil. We don't have English votes for English laws. There's not that sort of uh, rigidity. We are one chamber where all members are equal I think there's something to be said for that um, and it also avoids the rigidity of x number coming from a particular area um, and the method by which they're chosen if we do the present um, retain the present uh, means and improve it you're drawing people from the different nations on the basis of what they individually can bring uh, uh, to bear so I think that's actually rather important but if you think about the membership of the house and you know, the leading members that come particularly from uh, 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 Scotland, they're, they're extremely prominent. Um, uh, and of course, we, the, the, the voice of Northern Ireland is well heard uh, in the House. And we've got uh, a number, quite a number of members drawn from Wales who are prominent in their contributions. So whenever we have 
different parts of the UK considered, whether it's the Scotland Bill, the Wales Bill, you've got members who can speak with authority being drawn from those particular areas. And of course, some have got experience in serving in uh, uh, the Scottish Parliament. When the three devolved legislatures were set up, um, the presiding officer in each case was a member of the House of Lords. They found it quite useful to actually be in the Lords because, of course, they could um, share their experience between themselves as well as contribute uh, to debate. So I think that's actually quite uh, valuable. So it's developing what we've got rather than artificially uh, imposing something to sort of, quote, represent the different parts of the United Kingdom. Thank you. We are almost out of time, but I'm going to squeeze in one more question. So if I could ask for a very brief response, that would be wonderful, which is simply what one practical achievable change would you most like to see to the House of Lords? So perhaps uh, Baroness Grey Thompson, do you want to start? Uh, a part-time member of staff that Thank could you. manage the 800 emails plus I get a week. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Russell. I'd go with the package more or less proposed by the Lord Speaker's Committee, a cap on the size of the House so it's no bigger than the House of Commons and a requirement for balance between the parties and also between other demographic groups uh, controlled by the House of Lords Appointments Commission. Thank you. Lord Norton. Uh, well, like Meg, I'll, I'll perhaps cheat a bit um, because my one reform would be to implement the original House of Lords bill, which encompassed rather a lot of changes, including that quality threshold I mentioned, putting the Appointments Commission on a a statutory basis and having formula that limited the size of the house and ensured it reduced in number over time. Thank you very much. That was wonderfully concise from each of you. Um, the clock is though against us, so I think we will have to wrap up there. So I'd just like to end by thanking all of our panelists, Professor Meg Russell, Baroness Grey Thompson and Lord Norton. And I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us today and for all of the really fascinating discussion in the chat and in the questions and on Twitter. We will be carrying these questions on in future. So please do join us again. You can find details of all events on our website. You can also follow the Mile End Institute on Facebook, Twitter and on Instagram. Thanks to Sophia Cusano for producing today's event and we'll hope to see many of you back with us again in the future.